Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Clive Jones, and I'm the chairman of the Ronnie Mead Trust. And uh, it's my job to welcome you here to the sixth Jim Rose Lecture, and our very first in Manchester, and our very first at Manchester University. Ronnie Mead is Britain's leading race equality think tank, and Jim was one of our founders way back in 1968. The original aim of Runnymede was to counter racist propaganda and develop programs for an increasingly diverse Britain. And we're still at it, nearly 50 years on, and the challenges are no less great. Jim was at the heart of the fight for social justice in Britain for nearly four decades. And we've held this lecture in his honour six times since his untimely death in 1999. As I said, we're delighted to be here in Manchester and for the lecture to be hosted here at the Martin Harris Centre of the University. And we're particularly pleased that the School of Social Sciences and the University's Equality and Diversity Office have agreed to co-sponsor uh, tonight's event. And uh, it's made it very possible and very wonderful to be in this exciting and new environment for the university. Our speaker tonight is chair of the FA, chair of the BFI, chair of ATG, one of the, in fact, the biggest theater group uh, in the country, and was the Director General of the BBC. I've known him for almost as many decades as uh, Jim worked in terms of social justice, and he's one of my oldest friends. But he began life as a journalist. Um, he then went to York, uh, to the university there, to study politics. He came out and resumed his career in journalism, then became a campaign organizer, uh, for the campaign for racial equality um, and did two years of that before he went on to have a very glittering career in television, first of all as a producer, as an editor, as the, uh, the man who saved TVAM. That was his first role as an equality employer because we treated everybody very badly. Um, he went on there to be director of programs at TVS, director of programs at LWT, managing director of LWT, um, had a period running with the biggest independent um, company in the country, and then got to the BBC, where his concerns for social justice and racial equality were shown in his leadership of that organization, where he famously described the workforce of the BBC as being hideously white. And he set forth uh, to bring in a number of changes to casting, to portrayal, and to employment to start to ensure that that major cultural organization uh, in the UK uh, would cease to be hideously white. He's going to speak for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we're going to move into a discussion initially with him, and then we're going to broaden it out uh, with the rest of our panel. But ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Greg Dyke. What Clive didn't tell you is that I met him at TVAM when I was running it and he was the number two. Uh, he blew that joke just now, well, don't worry. Um, there was a wonderful moment in there when, when, because I was the boss, I said, look, I think one of us needs to be here at four o'clock every morning and I think it should be you. <laughs> I was once on a train from Manchester to London and I'm sitting across the table from this black guy. I've been to see Manchester United. He'd been to see some sort of rather obscure play, which told you quite a lot about both of us, I think. We got talking. I think I even bought him a drink, which, as Clive will tell you, isn't unusual. Anyway, as we talked, it, there was a sort of emerging for both of us. I realised he was a black actor from Casualty, and he realised that I was the Director General of the BBC. His name uh, 
was Kwame, and he told me a very funny story. He said that he was on the set of Casualty one day when he realised they were auditioning another black actor. And his instant reaction was, bugger that, that's me gone. Because <laughs> they never have more than one black actor on Casualty. I only tell you that story to tell you how for a lot of people, a lot of black people, how they used to view British television and the BBC in particular. And that conversation helped convince me that we just had to change uh, this organisation. So a couple of weeks later, I was being interviewed for a radio show in Scotland. And the interviewer, an Asian girl with a very broad Scottish accent, asked me if I thought the media, the media industry was hideously white. I replied, I think the BBC is hideously white, as Clive told you. And I thought no more of it until it was the front page lead story in the Mail on Sunday the following week. Now, I got all sorts of crap for making that statement. You know, and it's now 13, 14 years ago. I mean, have you read the letters column of the Daily Telegraph in the week that followed? They had, the letters had to be seen to be believed. The Colonel Blimps and the disgusted of Tunbridge Wells turned out from everywhere, protesting, basically saying, the basic argument was, of course the BBC is white. We are a white country. Now, I never regretted making that statement. In fact, I'm rather proud of it. Uh, because it was incredibly useful in convincing the staff and the management of the BBC that I was deadly serious when I said we were going to change the racial mix of the staff. So when I introduced a set of ethnic minority targets for staff and management, and with it, a star chamber system, for assessing every three months whether or not different departments were on their way to change, to meeting their targets. Everybody took it seriously. What was remarkable was just how quickly we were able to change some attitudes and change some numbers because senior and middle management discovered they were to be held accountable if we didn't change these numbers. And that in turn would impact on their annual assessments, on their bonuses and the rest. And in about three years, we did make a difference in the numbers. I think our total staff, we went from 6% to 10%, and in management, we went from 2% to 4%. They're still pretty pathetic figures. But we did make that change. And for me, making the statement about hideously white actually helped in other ways. It gave me credibility. When people from different ethnic backgrounds wrote to me to complain they hadn't got a particular job because they were being discriminated against on the grounds of either race or colour, it allowed me to say, look, you didn't get it. You might not. That might be right. You might not have got it because of your background or your race, but it might be there was a better candidate for the job. You see, the point I kept banging on about, and I have done all my life, I don't want anyone to get a job just because they're black or Asian, and nor do they. But I also refuse to accept that there weren't black people or Asian people who were capable of doing that job. I just refuse to accept it. And therefore, we were failing in that they weren't even there in the shortlist. I remember also saying to the BBC Executive Committee, Look, if we don't tackle this problem, we will become increasingly separated from our audience. I told them, you know, just look around most of the cities in Britain today and you will see not only what's happening today, but what the future looks like. And it's going to be very different. Ten years, twelve years later, of course, you now see that. Um, and I think, you know, it now pretty certain that in sometime in the not too distant future, you know, 10 to something like 25% of the people in this country will not be classically white. They will come, they will have 
you know, there will be uh, people from a black background, uh, African of origin, there'll be people from Asian origin, but also there'll be a very large number of mixed race. And that's the, what's happened in our society. And what I was trying to say to them was, if we don't understand that, and if we don't reflect it both on and off screen, because it's very oddly, I mean, if you went into the BBC newsroom when I first got there, on screen it was fine. Behind the scenes it wasn't. It was very, wasn't at all. Uh, if we don't understand that, reflect it both on and off screen, we are going to become increasingly irrelevant in this society. Because if we don't employ someone whose mum and dad were thrown out of Uganda by Idi Amman, or we don't employ someone whose mum and dad came from the Windrush generation, we will not understand Britain in the 21st century. We are employing people because of their talents, but we're also applying them because there's a bit in the back of the brain. I was brought up in Hayes in Middlesex. With that, I bring, I bring that to wherever you work. It's the same for everyone. I mean, it is interesting. I mean, 20 years earlier than that, you know, I do remember the BBC saying they were very proud of employing the brightest and the best of each generation. When you examined that, what it actually meant was that they were terribly proud of employing white men who'd overwhelmingly been to an English public school and to Oxbridge. You can see by the time I got there, <laughs> things had changed a bit. But in my time at the BBC, I argued that that's no good anymore. The BBC needs, in its employment policy, to reflect the society that is emerging. How else do you reflect 21st century Britain? Out of interest, Kwame, who became a bit of a mate, now runs a theatre production company in New York. And on that same train journey, he told me the story that you hear from so many people of his generation. His dad shouting up the stairs at his house in Southall, saying, kids, come down, there's a black man on the telly. And that was a, two decades earlier. And that, thankfully, has changed, had changed by the time I joined the BBC. And it was an era that had passed. Now, if you roll on to today, has the BBC made further progress? I don't know the figures. I don't, obviously haven't got access to them. But from what Tony Hall, who's the current Director General, has been saying, I doubt it. I think, uh, in some ways, I was lucky. I was there during a time of expansion. Uh, and therefore, you were employing new pe more people. But they've been through a period of uh, redundancies and all the rest of it, which makes it more difficult. But I don't think um, they've made further progress. And in many ways, I think Tony recognises that and is almost starting all over again. As I say, roll on to today. Today, I'm, as Clive says, I'm the chairman of the British Film Institute and chairman of the Football Association. So, in the second part of this rather brief lecture, I'm going to talk about films and football. Recently, at the BFI, we decided we want a proper policy on what is now called BAME. And we said, look, we're not satisfied. This is not an industry that is, this is an industry that is short of, that is desperately short of women, not on screen, but in terms of production. It is an industry that is incredibly white. We want a proper policy. After a few months, a policy paper came back to the board with all that usual well-meaning guff. And I couldn't see it any effective policy likely to change anything. So we threw it out. Because, and the argument we said was, look, there were some of us on this board who've sat on other boards over the years. We've seen well-meaning policy after well-meaning policy. Policy is a waste of time. 
what we wanted to see was some action. So what we're now doing is pretty simple. We are the lottery distributor. We distribute uh, some 30 million, 40 million pounds a year for film. And we now tell production companies, if you can't prove you have a diverse workforce, you won't get our money. And the film industry, I mean, often we're the last money and often it, it, it you know, particularly British film, needs that money. So we just said, prove it. Don't tell us all this stuff. You, you, you give us the figures. And if you can't prove it, we are not giving you the money. And if we find later that actually you've misled us, you will certainly won't get it for the next film. Interestingly, we are now being held up in the Department of Culture, Media and Sport as the model for what to do, which, I, again, I found a bit surprising. But I... And I understand that Channel 4, which has always been interested in this field, is finally going to bite the bullet and follow our lead. In other words, tie it to the money. I find it interesting that this current government actually is better at this than some of the predecessors. That actually, certainly in the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, they are very interested in what we're doing. And so... To football. 20 years ago, going to a football match could be a pretty distressing experience. Uh, I remember going to Chelsea and hearing racial abuse, seeing bananas thrown on the pitch, and at times you even saw racial violence. Today, much of that has gone. Now, I've no doubt that there are a range of factors which brought about this change. Certainly more black players, better grounds, less violence generally, better policing. But don't underestimate the role played by organisations like Kick It Out and the influence they gradually had, which was 20 years old this year, influence they gradually had over organisations like the FA, the Premier League and the Football League. And they did it, and one of the other heroes of this whole thing was the PFA, the Players' Union, because they decided, too, this wasn't, couldn't carry on, things had to change. But it was Kick It Out that convinced the people in football that change was possible. And influenced by external factors, the people in football, I think, realised that they not only could change, but they had to change. So this, does this mean the problem has all gone away? Well, amongst the crowds, I think we'd all agree that the position is much, much better um, than it was 20 years ago. Although it is worth noting that we still don't see the diversity in the crowds that would in any way reflect the public at large. I spent seven years as chairman of a club called Brentford, based in the London borough of Hounslow, a very Asian club. There were hardly any Asian fans who came to watch Brentford. And we, to our shame, didn't do anything about it. Today, the problem in football is what I would call institutional. We still, don't have as, we still don't have as many black managers or coaches as you would expect from a professional game where roughly 25% of the players are black. We have three black managers in 92 clubs in the Premier and Football Leagues. And I can't think, and I might be wrong, but I can't think of a single black chief executive amongst those 92 clubs. Clearly, this isn't good enough, clearly it needs to change. The question is, how do you do it? Um, earlier this week I got a text from someone pretty senior in football urging me to bring together the leaders of football to discuss this problem. What do we do about it? I sent him back a reply, I said, look, I would, I'll only do this if we, the FA, the Premier League and the Football League agree to commission someone to research the area 
and draw up a plan for change. The last thing you want to have is another conference. The last thing you want to have is another meeting, is another uh, bunch of people who sit there and say, yes, we all think something, and then nothing happens. There's got to be a plan for change. It's too easy to come up with supportive words which change nothing. What we need is a plan of action. Now, at the FA, I recently ran a chairman's commission. The major aim of the commission was to try to understand why so few talented English lads are getting into the first team at our Premier League clubs. But amongst our uh, proposals in the second report we produced, we suggested a radical reform of coach education. We don't think our coach education is good enough and we think there needs to be radical change. And that's something that the FA controls, so it's something we can do. But what we also said was, it is time to prioritise the BAME communities. So when we appoint our new head of coach education, he or she will be told, this is one of your major priorities. Why? Because if 25% if of all professional players are from an ethnic minority background, it means we have a lot of people to work with, as well as all the other people, black and Asian people who are involved in football in the grassroots. There are a lot of professional footballers coming out. We know there's a need. We know there's a supply. We just have to act and make sure that the, we facilitate the supply. So what about the clubs? Well, neither the FA nor the leagues have the power alone to make clubs employ BME coaches. It's not like, the football isn't like the BBC, where I was able to set targets and say, look, I'm the boss, this is what we're doing, and pressurise people into achieving them. That isn't the position in football. The 92 Premier League and Football League clubs are each separate, fairly small businesses with their own employment policies and practices. We can urge them to take action. We can't force them. Now, some people say football should introduce a Rooney rule, and the FA's Inclusion Advisory Board is looking at that. It might be a good way forward, but it won't be if it ends up as tokenism. To summarise, what we're trying to do is increase the supply of BAME coaches to make sure they're qualified up to a high level whilst at the same try time trying to work out what are the barriers to them getting appointed. Will we succeed? Yeah, I think we will. I'm pretty optimistic. The issue is now in the public arena. Just as 20 years ago, the issue of racial abuse from the, from the uh, fans, or from a small section of the fans, became, got into the public arena. And I think, therefore, over time, it will change. Probably won't change at the speed some people want it to. As I say, we have to affect the supply. But over time, we can change this. Because we've been, football has been, through the first stage of dealing with this problem, getting rid of overt racism. Now we're in the institutional phase. We know there's a problem and we've got to find the solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, a fascinating lecture. My name's Michelle Moore, I'm a trustee for the Runnymede Trust, and uh, I'm delighted now to introduce to you, formally, Brigitte Nizweku, who will be taking us through this next part of the lecture. 
You'll remember Bridget from Channel 4 as a news reporter and presenter for over 10 years, and we're delighted she's joining us this evening. She's still broadcasting and a part of the ITV news anchor team. So Bridget is also head of media training at the Press Association. Over to you, Bridget. Thank you very much, Michelle. Can everyone hear us at the back? Good, lots of, lots of heads nodding there. Um, Greg, interesting, you, you said a few things that jumped out at me straight away. Uh, so we're going to get straight to it because we have a limited amount of time with you today. Um, you talked about football being institutionally problematic. Institutionally racist? No, I didn't say it was institutionally racist. You said the problem is institutional. I said the problem next, the next problem is institutional. Mm. I.e., how do you change the component parts of football? To, that doesn't, it's not implying it's institutional racist, racism. It's saying this, we've done one, we've, football has been through one change, which I think they should take credit for. Mm. They should, people should say, well done. I think you've now got to go to the second part and say, uh, We've got to change this. Isn't it time to stop actually starting new initiatives? I think Lenny Henry recently talked about initiative fatigue. Is that perhaps, does that perhaps apply to football? Rather than getting all the leads together, as you mentioned in your speech, to draw up a plan, how about putting in the, actually putting into place the Rooney Rule, making sure that any time there's a vacancy, for a coach or a manager position in a club, they must interview at least one person of a BME background. Well, uh, we're why, looking, why can't that be put in place? We're looking at that. We've got a group whose job it is to look at that. You, I, I don't think you want to take instant solutions. But lots you've of got people to, you've got to, There's solutions. no point doing things if you don't think they're going to work. So what we've got to do is look at what do we think will work. It's worked in the change. States. Why, why wouldn't it work here? Uh, I, don't, I didn't say it won't work here. Uh, I think there's probably an argument for it. But we, we've got a group of people looking at that. And we'll wait and see what they come back with. You mentioned also that 25% of players have, are from this background. We so then, we've got lots of people to work with. So do you think things will change quickly? Well, I think you've got, there's, a lot of people in, there's a lot of people in football who will want to go through a coaching system and then get into the game. We're going to now say, OK, we are going to change our coaching system anyway, and we're going to say, look, we're going to look for 25% of the people going through that system who come from different ethnic backgrounds. Because if they don't get those coaching qualifications, they're not going to get there anyway. Mm. Now, then you've got to say is, are, as, they, as, as coaches, coaches from that background come through, are they going to get the jobs? I think that will come about with uh, a combination of talent and pressure. Affirmative action. Yeah. I've always believed in affirmative action. Excellent. So we're going to see some results then. Well, well you've, you've got to understand what I said. There are 92 clubs and they are all separate individual businesses. Mm -hmm. It is not like sitting at this university mm -hmm. where you could actually say, we're going to have a policy and it's going to apply to the whole university. You can do that. You can do that in a big organisation like the BBC. You can do it, you know, you could do it in Shell. You can do it in Marks and Spencer. Okay. It's much harder to do it when you're dealing with 92 individual companies. Okay, so let's think about that. One of the things you said was tie it to the money, which you're doing, you're doing in the film industry. Yep. Why can't it be tied to the money in football? For example, there's lots of collective negotiations over football uh, TV rights. Why can't there be some obligation that ties diversity to the money in football? If television companies or sponsors decided they wanted that was a criteria for them, yes, you could do it. So you would support that, and would you? We would don't you... have the money. We don't distribute the money. You have it the influence. Come to the FA. We have influence. We can the things, the things we can do about coaching and things like that. We couldn't just pass the rule and say this has got to apply to everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. You don't have let's, that degree of power. Let's move away from football. You did have some success at the BBC in, in improving diversity. Uh, in an organisation you described as hideously white. Would you say it's still hideously white? I don't know it closely enough to know, but I suspect it's still pretty bad, yes. The media... I go in there occasionally to do interviews and things, um, and it always still strikes me as I don't see a, mass, a sea change. 
Let's, let's, let's then broaden it out to the media as a whole. I mean, what was interesting at that back, back then, I mean, when we started analysing the numbers, you found things like BBC Birmingham, you had a, the Asian network, radio network. When you took those numbers out, mm. there was hardly anybody there mm. who was from an ethnic minority background. And actually what was interesting is the management of those organisations, when they saw these, were deeply embarrassed by them and changed it. Mm. So it, is, it is embarrassing in the 21st century, isn't it? It's I'm, I'm sure my uh, fellow panellists will agree. Yeah, it's, it's, it em it's embarrassing. So in terms of the media overall, um, Lenny Henry, Idris Elba, many other well-known creatives have been saying some action is necessary now. Um, not another plan, not some initiatives, but some action. Money, commitment, commitments to, well, I remember Lenny to create me, roles. On the day I said the stuff about hideously white, the day it was after it was in the Daily Mail, and everybody was, the, the Mail on Sunday, everybody was attacking me. Lenny rang me up and said, it's good, isn't it? well done. It's time somebody said it. Mm. Um, I think he's right. Uh, as I say, it's a much easier thing for an organisation like the BBC to do. And... Um, there's no point. It's a bit like we said at the BFI, you know, the board said, we don't want any more policy papers. Mm. We want to know what can you actually do. And we, in the end, said, look, you go back in and tr follow the money. Now, Channel 4 commissions an awful lot of programmes and has never, had, never gone f as far as that, but I think they will. Um, the BBC commissions a lot of programmes from outside the BBC as well as inside the BBC. Once you start saying, look, you're not going to get your money unless you can demonstrate this, they'll change. Mm. Now, football, as I say, is weird because it's harder. We don't have the money. The Premier League can't say that to its clubs because the Premier League is the clubs. So, so are, you, are you saying, actually, that the structure needs to change because the current structure well, militates I would, against... Well, I wouldn't have believed 20 years ago that football, that what's happening in football in terms of crowds would have changed as radically as it has. I mean, I found it disgusting going almost. Where would you like to see the number of BME coaches in, say, two or three years' time? Take, if, we're, if we're thinking about action... It'll take a bit longer than that, but say, okay, if you go five through years. five years... I'll time, give you five years. If you go through five years... I, we can certainly train, uh, to the highest level, several hundred BME coaches in that period. And what proportion of those would you like to see in post? Well, remember, the job of a... Just give me a number, because we're running out of time. What percentage? <laughs> what percentage? What percentage of those... Oh, 100, well, would you like to see in post? Well, again, it depends how good they are and whether they get the job. Let's assume no, what, they're all excellent. But what I'm asking to you, don't Let's forget... Let's assume they're all brilliant. Are you talking about coaches in coaching positions or yes. are you talking about coaching as, as managers? Because don't forget... Let's stick with coaches because we know the numbers. Yeah, there are 19 out of 552 at the moment... Who are qualified it, top range coaches, yes. OK, so oh, I think how many would you like to see in five years' time in uh, post 50, out of 552? 50 to 100. 10%. Hmm. Everyone no. like the sound of that? Because you've got to look at the change. You've got to say how long this is going to take. But remember, coaching, f football coaching and football management is an incredibly precarious job. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm I, th sure, I think I'm the sure, average Premier League sure manager lasts less than a year. Mm. So it's not about cutting it if you're black or white. It's, it's about surviving. Mm. It's I mean, about, the only, it's there's about only two things you do, as it seems to me, as a Premier League manager, is you, you negotiate your entrance and your exit at the same time, because it happens. <laughs> um, Greg, thank you very much. We're going to open up the discussion now to include our panel members. And as you know, they are Gillian Joseph from Sky News and Rimla Akhtar, who is chair of the Muslim Women's Sport Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, before I ask you any questions, anything particularly jump out of Greg's speech that you'd like to comment on? Gillian. I think... Um, Tying it to the money, yes. that phrase jumped out at me because I think it's not just about the perception of being part of the 21st century, it makes economic sense. And when you do tie it to the money, I think that's really how you're going to get results because that's where it hurts, pull the purse strings and people jump. Mm -hmm. So I think that really 
shot out for me. Rimla, quick comment from you. From my perspective, and I, I say this all the time, it's, it's really about institutional change. Structural change needs to happen, and we need to take a longer-term approach to this because this is not a short-term solution. Short-term solutions are not going to help <coughs> in the long run. Um, so for me, the structures have to change, uh, the policies and the procedures and how you deal with, certainly in terms of discrimination, some of the cases that come along, all of that process needs to be reviewed and put into action. Mm. Okay, Julian, I'd quite like to ask you a question about your experience of getting to where you are now as one of the most recognised broadcasters um, from the black and minor minority ethnic communities. We both follow in the footsteps of people like Maura Stewart. And um, at the very beginning of my career, I had a, uh, something happen which I'd like to share with you, which is that I went for uh, an interview for a BBC region that shall remain nameless. And I knew the moment I walked into the interview that I wouldn't get the job. Because they were clearly expecting an Irish-Polish person. <laughs> Bridget Nzeku, Bridget Irish <coughs> Nzeku, probably Polish. Uh, and the reaction was something like this. <laughs> and I sat down, I, I thought I did a great interview, um, wasn't very surprised to, to not get the job, and started work at ITN about a month later. Does that sound familiar at all? Have you had it, any incidents? It sounds that? very familiar. Um, I think it's just that the perception, really, that, that you know, you're not what they're expecting. Um, but that perception was wide. It wasn't just within the confines of broadcasting. One of my first broadcasting jobs was up in, uh, on Merseyside, working at uh, Radio Merseyside. And going out in those days with my Ewa, which is the big, heavy machines that we used to have. All these young people won't know about those in the massive microphone. And I'd go out onto the streets of Liverpool to do my Vox Pops. And people would be astounded. This is like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. There was this black woman with a microphone. They'd never seen anything of the like in their lives. And the first question I'd always get would be, how, how did someone like you get into a job like this? It just wasn't part of their term of reference. They just didn't expect somebody from my background to be in broadcasting. Mm. So I saw my time in Liverpool as a time to educate the population in the Northwest and then show them that people <laughs> of colour could do this job. And that's what it's about. The more but to get into the industry, the, the barriers will be broken down. Mm. I, my view is that actually in news, particularly which is what, what I know, representation on screen is very good and has yeah. been very good for many years. But actually the power lies with editors. And there isn't, enough, there isn't enough attention given to diversity in the power-broking no, of the totally newsroom. No, I totally agree. I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have the on-screen presence, but that's actually the tip of the iceberg and very superficial. The power lies with the executive producers and the editors. And when we have those team meetings, those are the people who decide what the running order is going to be, what will be number one, what will be number three in the running order. And also, they, they inform the whole debate. They decide where the stories go, what sort of... Um, people get involved in contributing to mm. the stories. And if you have a different pool of people at that decision-making process, it will be reflected right. on screen. So, so it's wonderful to have the faces, mm. of which I'm one, so obviously I'm very glad to be <laughs> <laughs> in a job. But it's actually really just very, very superficial. I can quickly ask you and then I'll see if Greg agrees. What do you think can be done to change that so that we do have more editors, people with power, uh, who are shaping the nation's perception of what's going on and, and information about what's happening, uh, how do we change it? Um, I think by getting people through the doors. I think by going to schools, to, to talking to people. Um, I mean, we're in an age of celebrity, so lots of schools that I go into and speak to people, you know, they want to be on screen, but I think it's, it's great for editors to go into schools and talk to people about the jobs behind camera mm -hmm. and explain that actually these are the decision makers. Um, so it's about changing public perception as to what constitutes a career in, in broadcast media. Greg, do you think that's right? Well, there's never a shortage of people who want jobs in broadcast media. You advertise a job, you get hundreds of applicants always. Uh, therefore, you've got to say, look, there was a certain percentage of these jobs are going to go to people from uh, ethnic minority backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, Clive did it when he was at um, 
ITN. I think 50%, for some years, 50% of all the trainees came from ethnic minority mm. backgrounds. Mm. And if you take that decision, so that's what we're going to do now, go find them. They'll be there, mm. they'll be talented, some will be good, some won't, like all other people you employ. But the idea that somehow this is, your, this is endangering what you're doing is just nonsense. Mm. But I do think you have to do that. And then it would be interesting. I mean, it, it, I mean, I, uh, what, I, I used to work at London Weekend Television many years ago. What changed London Weekend Television was they ran a thing called the Ethnic Minorities Unit, and they basically did two shows, one about Asians, one about black in London for London. But who came through those? Samir Shah, who ended up as, as, as head of current affairs and, and new, uh, head of current affairs at, at BBC, and Trevor Phillips, who, who was mm. editor of the London mm. programme, did all that stuff. Yes. What is interesting is that a, a decade or so on, where's the new Trevor Phillips and where's the new Samir Shah? And I don't see any evidence no. of them. Now, it could be that I'm away from the media, so I don't know, but I don't see a lot of evidence. Mm -hmm. I'd like to um, bring in Rimla now. Um, Rimla, let's go back to sport for a bit. Um, what do you think the barriers are for Muslim women when it comes to representation in sport? That's a broad question, but what, what are some of the barriers and what are the solutions? <laughs> How long have we got? Um, <laughs> I... Um, I actually, I, I don't like to answer questions specifically about Muslim women because actually I think that what, one of the biggest mistakes we make is we try and differentiate people and say that this particular group needs so much more attention on a particular thing. Mm -hmm. It's not like that at all. Um, it's, it's little tweaks that are needed. So for example, in our organisation, we do everything in an all-female environment in terms of participation, which means that all women actually, not just Muslim women, are comfortable and they enjoy being a part of that. Um, in terms of barriers, if you look at minority communities and women in particular from them, for me there's, uh, there's two aspects of it. There's the community side and then there's the sports industry side. On the community side, what we've dealt with traditionally is a lack of role models. Um, so Gillian talked about 20 years ago some of the stuff in, 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 in Liverpool, but you know, even the other week I'm still dealing with how I'm perceived um, as a woman who wears a hijab in the sports industry. Um, and within my community as well. I mean, last week I got... How a, are you perceived as a um, woman in hijab in the sports industry? Just, I, just enlighten us. I think us. people still have struggled to come up with something to say about it because they're so shocked by it. Um, it's still such a shock for them to see me, you know, hear that I'm on FA Council or um, I'm involved in all of these committees and, and organisations at, at the various levels. In the community, I think women in general, and this is from any background, there's still a negative perception, I think, of participation women in, women in sport, and that is changing. Um, I think it's still seen as a hobby for a, for a lot of communities. Um, again, that is changing, but because we're starting to see role models um, like Mo and Ali, we had Isha Gua in the England cricket team, yes. um, and others, um, you know, Christina Rugu, all these wonderful women out there that are doing great things. So the perception and um, you know, the understanding that it can be more than a hobby, that, that's changing, that's definitely changing. On the sports industry side, you've got a real sort of lack of confidence, I think almost a fear factor around the communities not knowing how to work with them, a uh, fear of saying or doing the wrong thing, um, as well as you know, this kind of image of these women, and I certainly had to deal with that with the foundation of Muslim women don't want to play sport or they can't play sport. Um, they're not allowed to, and, and those were myths that we had to break down through through example, really. So there's there's two aspects to it, I think. Do do you think that f money play has a role here? Do do, do you do you see Greg's um, expression tied to the money as something that's relevant in the field you're in? Because Gillian yeah. certainly. Um, I, I'd you know, agree. Yeah. I think that, that um, ultimately money talks in, in in the sports industry as well mm -hmm. as, as any in industry. Um, and I think that personally I feel that when it comes to issues around inclusion and diversity targets, um, which, by the way, it's not just a problem in the football industry, it's right across the sports industry, and I see it every week, you know, every week mm. um, some of the issues that other sports are dealing with. Um, if we do start tying their targets to you know, how much money they receive, and I think that should be coming from government right down in terms of the governing bodies, um, we'll start to see governing bodies take this seriously and rather than it being initiatives and talk about how yes. we can include people, we'll actually be saying, okay, we need to do something about it now. 
Mm. Um, because our, our future depends on it. And even from a business case perspective, mm -hmm. as you said earlier on, it makes more sense that if your community is diversifying and, you know, from a business perspective, you need your participation rates to go up. How about you be more inclusive and you might just see that happen? Mm. Julian? Um, I was just introduced what Greg thought of um, accusations of, of tokenism, because that's always the, the counter argument that, yes. that people are put in place simply because they are black and they're not <laughs> capable. Well, you're at the moment, I mean, I know that this government is, is looking at what, what is it on the FTSE 100 companies, how does it ensure that there's at least, just as they've ensured there's a woman on every board, how do they make sure there's some black stuff? Now, I just don't believe anyone's going to appoint anybody to a board just because of their colour. They're just not going to do it. What they'll want to do is make sure they, find, they might be looking for someone of, of, of colour, but they'll be looking for someone who is talented, and there's enough talent around. I mean, so I, I, That's the I, issue, isn't it? Yeah. Actually, there's a lot of talented people who just don't have the access, who don't have the networks, because the people who are making the decisions don't connect with those communities. So it's not it, really a lack of talented individuals who can do the job, it's giving those people access. I think that's, that's the key thing here. I mean, even with the Rooney Rule, we were talking about it earlier, it's not about quotas, it's about saying, give people the opportunity, because we've heard this phrase a lot, it's a closed structure within sport. It is your, your mate and so-and-so knows so-and-so and, so and they'll, they'll get the job, and it's a mm. case of opening up those structures and making it more inclusive and giving people the opportunity to actually show that they too can shine. Mm. I mean, um, would, would you agree, Greg, that it's, it would be worth organisations, whether it's football, media or any other organisations, understanding that they are not relevant if they are not diverse? They're just not relevant to society as a whole. They don't represent society and therefore they need to see diversity as an essential issue of remaining relevant. Yes, change out there. But we, it is a different society to the society of 50 years ago. Now, actually, if you're, if you're a commercial organisation and you're selling to that, you know that now. You've only got to look at the change in, say, television advertising from 20 years ago to today. They know that. Mm. They have, you know, this is, this is a big part of their market and they've got to get that. Um, one of the lines I've heard quite a lot in football is, uh, well, we're elected and you come through a process and there aren't enough people who want to stand. Mm. Now, again, if you take a decision that actually what you want is a more ethnically mixed board, you go and find the people who sit on your board. It's not very complicated. No. And there are people, and they will do it. And if you, you know, when, when, when I hear that, if, you know, through all sorts of, you know, they've done it here at the FA in Manchester, you know, they've actually done it, you know. Whereas, well, the police have done it, yeah, for example. You've got, um, yes, you, you've just got to say, look, we're going to change this. Mm. And you can change, and it will, you can change it. But you've got to have the will. It's not enough to say, oh, well, we, we're open, we're not, we don't discriminate. It's not enough. You've got to go out and be positive and go, fine. OK, a question to uh, all of you, which is going to look at it from a, from a different angle. What is it that the audience needs to do and the population as a whole in order to make this change happen? Because we don't really want to wait for institutions to, to change things because the pace of change is so slow. So is there something that, I don't know, viewers of news programmes, drama, uh, football well, fans... They, they need to say... What do we need to be doing? They need to say what they would like to see, that, you know, some members of the, the audience from black and ethnic minority groups need to say, I want to see myself reflected on screen. Hmm. Um, even in a period drama like Downton Abbey, why not? You know, there's been debate on that. Mm. They want to see themselves up there. Children growing up can actually see others like them, as I did. You mentioned Moira Stewart. Yes. Because of Moira Stewart, because of Sir Trevor MacDonald, I believe that I could actually one day have a job like that. Mm. So people have to demand. You know, very powerful now. And with, I know on 24-hour news, I'm on air for maybe four or five hours at a time. And I'm constantly in contact with the public. Mm. It's as immediate as that. Yeah. So I need to let 
the decision makers know what they want and demand what they want. Rimla, do, do, you, do you think there's, um, there needs to be a, some way of the public being able to lobby more effectively to, to gain this better representation? I think so, and I think one of the, the main things that, that I believe is that when we work together, we're a lot stronger. And I think there are a lot of um, individuals I know, certainly as in the sports industry that I've met, that are in really strong positions in, in you know, individuals who are in, in particularly influential positions. Um, and we, we, we need to work together to start to create that change from, from within. Um, you know, I work with people, um, with organizations to help them understand and get what these issues are. Um, and I think that if we can all kind of unite, um, as it will be a much stronger force to be able to create that change and actually see the, the actions on the ground. So you're talking about partly being better at networking. Yeah, definitely. And I, for me, unity is key in this issue. Um, there are a lot of issues. There's obviously issues, if you take football, there's issues around the lack of black coaches, um, which is a massive issue. But then I, I'm from the Asian community and I look at the lack of Asian players um, you know, there's so many male Asian players at the amateur and semi-pro level. Why, I, I can't believe for a second that there isn't at least one or two within there mm. that could make it up to the, to the pro level. What, is, um, what does Greg have to say about that, actually? It's a good point, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's... What, what's I, the problem? I don't know. I seriously don't know. I mean, but, but I, I agree with you. I, don't, I, I just don't <laughs> believe it could be that there aren't people with talent. So, but nor do I believe that it's they've been discriminated against mm -hmm. as because they're Asians. I mean, that doesn't make sense in a, in a, in a professional game that's got 25% black players. It could be a stereotyping. It could be all sorts of things. I don't know, really. Um, but you're right. There, aren't, there are quite a lot of Asian players playing at, at, at a certain level and not playing at professional level. I think stereotyping in itself actually is a form of discrimination because yes. we had the same thing, um, obviously with the black players um, becoming coaches and certain stereotypes that people had of, of black players and would they be able to make it as a coach. And similarly, we've got the same thing with Asian players. Would they be able to make it and commit as much um, and make it to the pro level? And unfortunately, those stereotypes do exist out there. But on top of that, there is, as I said earlier on, this systematic change that needs to happen, even talent IDing, do the talent scouts go to the right places to find these players? Mm -hmm. It's a big, you know, big piece of work that needs to be done. And do you think then we really do need to look at things like the Rooney Rule and targets for yeah. number of Asian players, number of um, black coaches, Asian coaches? I, th I think t targets are useful in the short term. Um, and they should support the longer term work as far as I'm concerned. We could have targets for absolutely everything because there's so much to deal with. It's not just racism, there's, there's sexism, there's, there's issues around faith, um, you know, homosexuality, etc. that need to be dealt with. Um, we could have targets for everything, but ultimately it's about looking at the system itself and is, is it working the way it should? Because if it were, were to work properly and naturally, we wouldn't be talking about these issues. So if you were um, in Greg's position, let's, let's, let's imagine for a moment that you are in his position in the FA. What, what are the three things that you would do straight away Gosh, to change the... <laughs> that's a hard one. <laughs> um, I think ultimately for me, we need, there's one thing, we need a vision for this. Mm -hmm. We need a vision to say, where do we want to be in five, ten years' time? Like any business would for financial reviews, for you know, business well, we know processes that. and things. Because Greg would, would like to see be... 50 black coaches in the next mm. five years. Well, well, how about we see oh. a reflection of the 25%, <laughs> you know, in, in terms of coaches? That's the vision that we need to see. Mm. Uh, we need to put that vision together. We need to look at do a review, really, of the processes and the procedures that are within the sport. And I, I think not just football, we should be doing this cross-sport. Um, we should be looking at those procedures and saying, where are we, <coughs> where is it not working? But the good point you know, that Greg made earlier on, that it's not just the FA. Mm. The, the problem with this is you've got the Football League, the Premier League, the PFA, the LMA, um, you've got all the local county football associations, etc. It's such a huge you know, huge community to deal with, um, and everyone has their own kind of um, strings, you know, the areas that they need, they need to focus on on a local level. I think really we have to look at the whole structure of the game, 
and say where can we influence um, as well as how do we get our own house in order at the FA. Mm. But, but it is hard enough. I mean, the, the commission that I set up last year, ran for a year, was looking at how do you get um, more English players, of whom a, dis a disproportionate number are going to be playing. Mm. How do you get more English players through this system into, the, in, into professional clubs? And what you discover is there is a barrier. And that barrier has nothing to do with race or anything like that. That's a barrier about um, the barrier, but the jump between being uh, at an academy and getting into the first team in the Premier League is now too hard. Mm. You can't get through. Uh, so you've got to. So you know there are lots of barriers in, in all this that aren't just about race. They're about how do because I'm one of my big things is look a lot of these kids are very talented and deserve their chance and are probably good enough. But somehow we've got a system that says it's, it's better to go and sign another bunch of overseas players. Mm. And we've got a, again, institutionally, you've got a, a, a European Commission or a European Court ruling that says we can't really do anything about that. Are you hopeful? About the future, then, Rick. It sounds slightly I'm, defeatist. No, no, no. I don't. I think, uh, in terms of English kids getting through the system, yeah, I think it's difficult. Uh, in terms of coaches, I think we can change that. Mm -hmm. we're, we're expecting you to, I think, aren't we? Yeah, well, we've well, given you a number. You've given me a number. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And you've picked on the That's bottom end of the number I said. So, I mean, yeah. no, no. We, we will certainly. There is no. We can do it. We because we will say. We will say. Look, we want 25% of the people going through this system have got to come from ethnic minority backgrounds. Mm. Go. And if you can't do it, come and explain why and what's not that. And I just don't believe it. We will do it. Mm. It's Clive's story at ITU, honestly. It is. Um, so, um, finally, before we uh, wrap up, I'd, I'd like us to just think over some of the points that Greg made and that we've been discussing here. It's not just waiting for organisations like the Football Association, the BBC, etc., to implement change. We need to network, we need better networking, we need the audiences, the fans, basically people in the audience here, to lobby for this change, because that demand will force change. I think that's a fair summary, Gillian? No, I think so, I think so, and it's up to all of us, you know, society, has to, as, as you were saying, come together on this. And we, we know what we want reflected on our screens and in our, our football clubs. And we know what's not acceptable. And we're quite away from being where we should be. So, I mean, it's up to people to, to demand what they want. And also for um, the decision makers to listen and realise that it does make economic sense to reflect society at large. Mm. Rimna? Yep, totally agree. Um, as I said earlier on, I think it's, it is about are supporting one another in, in this drive to, to create change. Um, and I think that that can only be done when we're unified. Mm -hmm. and, and Greg, do you, do you think, I'll get you to put your cards on the table now, do you think we're going to see a Rooney rule in the UK? What's your feeling? You said that, that it's being looked at at the moment. Um, if you were a betting man, what would you say the odds are? Uh, I would. The odds 50 50. Because everybody's, every, everybody's, everybody's got to agree. There's no point us saying there's a rule of all, you've got to do it. Because we can't make them do it. So everybody's got to agree. Mm. Uh, I think there'll probably be the equivalence. But then you've got to say, are we seeing change? Is it happening? Yes. I mean, there is no doubt that the people who run the Premier League, the people who run the, uh, the Football League, and the people who run the FA now all recognise there is a problem. And that's probably not where they were two years ago. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. it is. Positive. Well, well, thank you all very much for your time. Rimla Akhtar, Gillian Joseph and Greg <laughs>
make a massive um, social media apology. I should have told you that it's uh, hashtag Runnymede. Um, so if you do want to tweet, please do tweet. Um, we're going to move into the Q&A section. We've just got a brief amount of time for questions, and there are a couple of mics roaming around. Um, please, can you keep your questions brief, because we just have a very short amount of time. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand. Jason, I will come to you. I will come to you. Could you say your name and where you're from? Just wait for the mic, the Jason. Mic, sorry. The mic to now. Hi, my name's Jason Arde. I'm a trustee of the Running Me Trust. Um, and basically, I just wanted to ask the panel um, do you think there are actually realistic opportunities for BME individuals to pursue a career in the media realistically? Absolutely. I mean, I'm here. <laughs> you know, there, there, there's nothing to stop you banging on those doors. I had to bang on those doors all those years ago. And you keep pushing, you keep pushing, and one day that door, that door will open. Um, I think where the problem lies is that many people perhaps don't think it's a realistic prospect. But hopefully people like myself, like Bridget, who are there, you know, we're, we're not special. I'm not saying you're not special, Bridget. <laughs> but there's nothing extraordinary about us. We're exactly like you. So if we can do it, you know, then, then every, anybody can. I would just add to that and say um, you need what everyone else needs, which is persistence. And if you really want to do it, don't give up. Put your face in people's faces. You know, my first day at Channel 5 News as work experience, I went straight up to the editor and said, I'm Bridget Nzeku and I want to be a reporter and I want to present your programme. And he, he laughed, but he remembered who I was and he did give me a job several years later. So I, I think you just have to make yourself irresistible. And um, we've got irresistible people on the panel here who managed to do it. Thank you. But you also, I think, this thing comes in phases, and I think you're in one of the phases now where the media industry is suddenly terribly conscious that it actually hasn't done very well. So it's probably a good time. And just there in the blue shirt. Um, do you want me to say who I am? It would be great. Yeah, yeah, my name is John Brown, well. live in Manchester. Welcome to Manchester, um, probably one of the most diverse cities in the UK. Um, I'm, I'm on the, I'm not part of the FA, I'm the vice chair of the advisory Ad inclusion board for the Manchester FA. And I, I was really interested in what you were saying because I've had this discussion with Rimler. It, it's all well and good to say we need to do this and that, but actually the FA needs to put its own house in order before it's sort of reaching out and saying to other people about they should be taking on more black people, more gay people, more women. Because if, if you were to do an audit of your own organisation top to bottom, you'd probably be in the same position you were when you joined the BBC. It isn't reflective of its communities. There's a lot of issues. And I do think there's something about having that authenticity in, in challenging others if you can do it from a position of strength and, and it's something I, I, you know you said to people tie it with the money you're you can actually change the fa and, and i understand all the other bit about persuading other people you've got to persuade them you've got to cajole them but it's like you you start with your own house really and you've mentioned a few times about setting your own house in order i think the fa could do with a, maybe an equality audit and a bit about where black people where women are in positions and I know there's a thing about elections, but you can, as you said, you can always say, well, let's, if, you know, you could say tonight, well, for every FA job, let's have the Rooney Rule there and let's see if it works. Because if you're not convinced of it, why not try it out? And if it's a complete disaster, we'll say, well, it was a complete disaster and we'll come up with something better. But if it, if it isn't, you'll be seen as a pioneer. So I think I'd, I'd look, shorten the odds and go, you know, go for a, a winning bet rather than the 50-50 chance. And you've got the chance like, in your organisation like to thinking. try that out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, John. Great question. Well, you have to distinguish between the staff of an organisation, which we have total influence over, mm -hmm. and uh, we, are, we have done that in the past. We're doing it again now, exactly what you're suggesting. Um, and I don't... Uh, it's quite... <laughs> in terms of females and in terms of race, quite racially mixed, doesn't appear to be at the senior level. Um, and the elected members of the organisation who come from all over the country, who we uh, have more problems influencing, 
Uh, I mean, I have said about our board, look, you know, on a board where four come from the professional game and four come from, are elected by the, the wide family, how do we decide what, you know, talent and mixture we want? Because we only get, I, there's, two, there's three non-executives on this board. Now, I'm, in most companies, you would look at your board and say, I mean, at the BFI, we certainly sat down and said, we're not very racially mixed, we've changed that. We're not, we haven't got enough women, we've changed that. But then you also say, uh, we, got, we need a lawyer, we need an accountant, we need, because you, you try to arrange your board. Uh, that's much harder if you're not appointing them from up here, but they're coming up from down there. And just in the middle there. Mike's on its way. Just in the middle, in, at the front here, just at the front here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Golam, and I'm from Manchester. And I'd just like to extend on a point that uh, Romana brought up about um, British Asians and, by extension, also Arabs. Um, myself, um, I've played football for a very long time, since, since I can remember, and I've played for many, many teams growing up. Not so much now, so I've put on a lot of weight since. Um, and um, some of <laughs> um, And, so, and um, basically, the point I want to make is that the people I've played against, there's been a wide representation of British Arabs and Asians playing football. And it's a bit confusing when you see such a diverse range of people playing football, but they don't actually make it to the top. They don't go through the amateur levels and the semi-professional levels and make it to the professional level. I think uh, Greg sidestepped that question and, he did, and said it's, you know, it, there isn't any sort of discrimination, but I find that very difficult to believe. When we have, by parallels in, the, in the, the, the cricket, you have many Asian players that have made it to the, the cricket team. Why can't we have that with the, with the football association as well, with the football teams? Um, what is being done by the FA to get um, more uh, minorities from the Arab and Asian community into professional football? And my second point was, actually, that's it. Yeah. 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 Good luck, good luck, thank you. We, that's not the role of the FA. The role of the FA, we, we, you know, we support football at a massive level. The clubs identify the talent and bring them through. The system now, I think, is pretty exhaustive. Uh, if you're quite, you know, talented kids seem to get in. Actually, the criticism you could make of the system is that too many talented kids actually get into the system and very few make it. Very, very few make it. And that, I think, is a criticism of the system. Quite why that doesn't apply to Asian uh, uh, um, people of Asian background and Arab background, I honestly don't know. I'd invite you, Rimla, to... Yeah, answer. I think um, the, the point that you've made um, around lack of Asian football, as I made earlier on, it, it's there, and I think that there, is, there are some barriers there that, that, that need working on. There are some initiatives that are taking place um, with, that the FA are, are, are um, involved. Obviously, my work in the Inclusion as Advisory Board, um, I hear about it um, quite a lot and support it quite a lot. So there are programs around identifying Asian talents um, within the community, um, but also in terms of coaching, um, getting our Asian coaches to actually help integrate them into clubs um, and getting that, that talent out there as well. But actually, and I made this point earlier on, it's not just a problem for football because even if you look at cricket, you gave the example of cricketers, we've got Marin Ali in there at the moment, we had Ravi Bakara for a while, we had um, Monty obviously for a little while as well, before him Sajid Mahmood. So we've had these one or two individuals being in the team at some stage, but actually if you look at the amount of cricket that's played by Asians in this country, and uh, you know, that, that come from abroad, it's something like 30% I think of cricket, they did a piece of, piece of research recently, 30% of cricket is played by Asians. Why aren't we seeing that reflected in the coaching structures and the playing structures? Um, and I would say the same on the women's side as well. We've got no um, people of colour in the women's, women's team for cricket at the moment. We had Isha Guha, we had Ebony, but they've now retired. So it's a, it's a cross-sport problem. Thank you. We've just got time for maybe two more. There's one here and one up there. Just on the third row, young man, that's right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
My question is kind of aimed at Mr. Dyke again. Firstly, thank you for that insightful uh, presentation, uh, speaking about what you've done around diversity. Uh, I work for an organisation called Sporting Equals. Uh, I think Michelle was at the event last week. Yes. We had an event at the House of Lords uh, called Leaderboard that found that from 45 governing bodies, only 3% of people for, on boards that were from BME communities. So it's kind of expanding from the point the gentleman made from uh, Manchester, for Manchester IA group is, if we are gonna change something, it has to change from the top. It has to change from board level, it has to change the CEO positions. It's, it's really good tackling this kind of participation agenda, uh, tackling black managers. But if we, don't, if we don't change from the top, nothing's gonna change. Uh, so kind of first, my question is what can be done to ensure the decision making, the power, that, that changes at the top. Uh, and also when you are BBC, how much change at the at kind of direct executive board level, uh, how, how much influence did you have over that and did anything change at that level as well? I'll be totally honest, when I was at the BBC, we had uh, no people from ethnic minority backgrounds on the boards. So we decided as, as uh, um, on the executive board, in other words, working for the organisation. And I put an enormous amount of pressure on the head of HR to find me someone who was the, the right talents and background to come and become an executive. And we did. We got Pat Young to come back to the BBC. Uh, he's gone off somewhere else now. He's, he's always coming and going somewhere. But we got Pat Young to come back to the BBC because of that. And we were, we were acutely aware of that, that, that you have to, it's not enough to just do it there, you've got to do it then. And what interests me, if you look at the BBC board, uh, executive board today, I wonder how different it is, or is it still white? In which case, why didn't that generation come through? You know, and, I, and, and that's because I'm not there, it's 10, you know, it's 10 years since I left, so I don't know. But that's the questions I'd be asking. Hang on, we employed quite a lot of people who came to say, why didn't they come through? They came through on screen, they probably come through as producers. Why haven't they come through to be executives? Okay, we've got time for just one more question. It's just at the back over there. Apologies for the others, but this is in the order of the raised hands. Please work with me. I'll come to you if I have the time. Please work with me, people. I'm a, I'm a teacher by trade, so this is, this is how it goes. Um, right at the back, on the, on the left-hand side. If I've got time, I will make sure we have equality of opportunity, because that's my business. At the back. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Danny Fitzpatrick, uh, lecturer in politics here at Manchester. Um, I can't sort of help thinking that we're sort of trying to solve a 21st century issue with sort of governance structures that haven't changed since the 19th century. And it seems quite obvious from what, from what Greg has said that the FA is severely constrained in what it can do to affect what the clubs decide to do and what the Premier League decides to do. So don't we need fundamental reform of the governance of football, whether that, and it's probably going to need government intervention, sort of root and branch reform. Thank you, good point. Any response from Rimla? Yeah, I, I made that point earlier on. I think that the, the pressure needs to come from the top and from the government that says, we, we're saying you need to set targets. When you do your whole sport plans, you need to be saying what your commitment to diversity is in, in concrete terms. Um, and I think the point um, you know, th that we were all making earlier around um, you know, funding being linked to this as well is, is a massive thing. It needs to come from the top, but we also need the leadership of all these governing bodies, everyone who looks after all these organizations within sport, to say we are committed to this and actually saying, rather than being constrained by what we have, let's set a plan for ourselves and let's set a vision for ourselves and get there. Thank you. Last word, if you'd like, Greg, you've got 30 seconds. Um, On fundamental reform. Governments have been talking about the fundamental reform of sports organisations for at least 20 years. And they've never done it. But you can. Uh, I can't. The organisation can. Mm. Yes. Okay. The organisation can. I have to sum up because we have some guests that have to leave us very, very quickly to get on the last train. So if I'm talking and two of our guests, Gillian and Greg, do leave, it's because they have to get on a train. Can we please give our panel a big hand?
A very big thanks to Greg, to Rimla, to Gillian and to Bridget for giving up their time and being here with us this evening. We've heard, um, I think, really thought-provoking discussion tonight. We've heard Greg talk about linking it to the money. We've heard Rimla talking about working together stronger to create better change. We've heard Gillian talk really passionately about visibility of people of colour. And we've heard Bridget talk about all of, the, all of us tapping into our own individual sense of leadership and responsibility and contributing to this agenda in the pursuit of equality. So a big thanks to them. We're here tonight in testament to Jim Rose, the Running Mead uh, co-founder. And I'd like to just say a big thanks to all the staff here at the Martin Harris Centre, the School of Social Sciences and Manchester University's Equality and Diversity Office who have co-sponsored tonight's event. A big thanks to the Running Mead staff and the director, Omar Khan, and to Professor Clare here at the Manchester University in helping to make this evening possible. But also, a massive thanks to you for coming out this evening and to being a part of this lecture. Everybody is welcome to join us at the reception to continue the discussion. Please still contribute to the debate on Twitter and on social media. A big thank you for coming. A very warm thank you to all of you.